Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Mike Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Owner Writer for Old Capital, and joining me today is James Eng. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Also with Old Capital. Unfortunately, Mike Becker is on assignment. So today in the podcast, we have J.C. Castillo. J.C. Castillo. J.C. is from the San Jose area, San Jose, California area, and he has built a position of multifamily ownership in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So we're going to talk a little bit about how do you manage and own properties from a, a distance? It's kind of the theme that we're going through for this month is how do you own a property? How do you manage the property? How do you service the transaction? And how do you find more properties when you're not in the marketplace itself? So JC is a good source. He's going to share a lot of good information with us. So let's kick it off for everybody to meet JC. JC, meet everybody. Hey, thanks for having me, Paul. I appreciate it. No problem. So, uh, I would think that we would talk a little bit about what your background is, what you currently do for a living, what you want to do. Tell us a little bit more about uh, J.C. Castillo. Well, a little bit about me. Let's see. I've got about 15 plus years of uh, industry experience in the semiconductor space and always have had a little bit of a passion for real estate. And uh, somewhere down the road in my career in the semiconductor space, I decided to uh, get into the real estate business. And one thing led to another. I had bought a couple of rental homes in San Jose made a couple bucks and started going to a few networking clubs and found a couple guys at the networking clubs who had a couple things in common that I enjoyed was a lot of time and they had you know pretty good amount of money and they were all apartment guys. You know, all the single family guys were just busy spinning their wheels and working pretty hard. And apartment guys seemed to have a little bit more time. So decided to try to buy an apartment complex in San Jose, which was really a sad thing once I actually looked at the negative cash flow situation. So by necessity, I really had to go out of state. That's how I landed out in Dallas. I did a lot of research and really zeroed in on Texas pretty quickly. But from there, zeroed in on Dallas-Fort Worth. You know, there's excellent markets out here, but I think DFW represents a pretty diverse uh, job economy, which is what drew me here. So no one-trick ponies, which was one of my big concerns going into the markets out here. So let's jump into, you went to a couple clubs, figured out multifamily was the right spot. And then looked at Texas, chose Dallas. Now, a lot of people in California want to be in Dallas. Take us back to that first deal. And how did you identify that deal? And then when and close that transaction? Well, gosh, my first deal, I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, there was a gentleman out in uh, the West Coast uh, at one of the networking clubs who I had befriended who had a lot of experience in the apartment industry. And I shadowed him out here to Dallas a couple times, hooked up with one of the owners that had a deal up in uh, Sherman, Texas. And I, you know, made an offer, did all my underwriting, all my analysis, uh, and have an engineering background. So tried to be as number detailed as I could. Uh, Long story short, we couldn't converge on a price that made sense for that deal. But in the process of going through the due diligence, I had hooked up with a contractor that I was going to use to do some work on that deal if we were to take it under contract. And as I was talking to this contractor, I had to call him after the deal and say, hey, you know, we didn't get the deal. And he turned around to me, he goes, ah, oh, that's too bad. He goes, you know, I actually have a couple properties in Garland, Texas. I said, you interested in selling them? He said, I might be. So that's pretty much how it happened. We put a deal together. He sent me the financials. It just so happened that he was, his main business was in the apartment industry, painting and uh, construction. And he had bought a couple deals with his dad some time back, and they were sort of more of a nuisance for him. At that time, you know, the market wasn't like it was today, so he really wasn't making much profit. And he was doing all the management stuff himself. So when I offered to buy him, he was actually pretty excited about it because if he could make a couple bucks and get rid of the properties, that was going to be a good day for him. So that's how the first deal happened. It was off market. In fact, it was direct to owner and it was completely accidental. I tripped over myself enough to make sure that it didn't happen, but somehow I guess luck played a part and that's how I got my first deal done. Actually, it was two deals. So how many units was that? The first two deals I bought were one was a 24 unit deal in Garland and the other one was a 50 unit deal. So both of them together were 74 units 
And the two properties were about two miles from each other. So we had a common crew. And then we hired a third-party management company to take care of the assets for us. So what year was that that you purchased those two? We bought those deals in 2007. 2007. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you still own those deals today? We actually sold them in October of last year. So we held them for a good long time. And by that time, we had sort of gotten into bigger assets. And so we really were looking to uh, 1031 exchange, sell those properties, which we did, and move them over into a bigger size deal. Okay. So going into maybe some of these bigger transactions, maybe talk about a recent transaction that you've completed and how you decided on sort of the size that you're going to specialize in, in this area. You, you get into this business and you, you think that your first deals you do are bigger than you would ever want to do. And then you get comfortable and you grow. And I think that I'd like to tell you that there's a size of deal that we'd like to stay at, but I mean, we seem to be scaling bigger and bigger. And, you know, right now we're at a comfort level between 100 to 200 unit in size for deals. I think that from a uh, management perspective, the optimal size of deal is definitely, definitely, definitely over 125 units or so because you don't want to have to piecemeal a staff together between, you know, several different properties, which is kind of what we had to do in the, in the early years. But, you know, I think 100 to 200 units is sort of in our wheelhouse at this point. So how large was the last transaction that you guys did? The last transaction we did was 120 units in size. The deal okay. before that was 128 units. Okay. So are all your units in Garland or are they spread out throughout? Well, it just so DFW? happens that four out of the five are in Garland and okay. we've sold several others that were in Garland. So I have sort of by default become Mr. Garland to some <laughs> Garland. of the people running in our, our circle of, of friends. But I do look for our, the other deals outside of Garland. It's just that Sometimes when you become known for something, people kind of bring you deals in that neighborhood, and that's sort of that what way. happened. Yeah. So but Garland's been a great submarket for me, but we're certainly open to other areas. And so, I mean, going back to some of the points that Paul started with, you live in California. So how are you managing these four or five deals yeah. at 100 150 units. Of- right. That was a scary thing back in the early days. You know, we had a significant amount of capital between myself and my original partner. And we were a little bit concerned about that. We ended up hiring a third party management company because we wanted to make sure that there was boots on the ground here locally that could oversee the day to day operations. And for the most part, I've seen, you know, all over the map in terms of how third party management companies do. Some do pretty good, some do not so great. And I think we had a, a fairly decent experience, but I think we always felt like we could build a better mousetrap. So from our perspective, what we did is when we scaled big enough, we basically formed our own third-party management company. But the twist is that we are completely captive to our own property. So we do not third-party manage. It is a separate company that we have that manages our assets, and we do have an executive staff here that's based in Dallas. However, we do not third-party manage anybody else's uh, properties. And that's, in a nutshell, kind of how we solved the management problem. And many people can solve it in different ways, but we've chosen to be what you would really call owner-operators. So what do you think the biggest advantage of having your own management side and disadvantage? Because you're sort of in the in-between space where... You know, some guys, they don't really, not until they're maybe at 10 properties, do they bring the management in-house? Yeah. Well, the way that I explain it to people is if you look at third-party management as a uh, sort of a a meter or, you know, if you will, a a fuel tank, if you're operating at 100% efficiency, that's sort of like the unobtainable goal, right? right? Not even if you have your own management company, will you ever optimize and be at 100% efficiency of, of a deal that you manage. But the way that I explain it is that I feel, based on my experience with third parties, is that the best management companies can get to about 90% efficiency. Okay. And the the not so great ones can sometimes get down in the 70% to 75% efficiency, meaning that it's just a suboptimal operation and you're just not, you're leaving money on the table as an owner. If 100% is the obtain, unobtainable goal, it would only make sense to me as an owner if I could get beyond 90% efficiency to open up my own shop. And I believe that we're probably, if I had to say, put a number, we're probably like at 95%. I believe that we do a much better job than mostly any other management company for our own assets and the way that we're set up because we only answer to one ownership methodology, one set of ideas. The challenge with management companies, even the best ones, is that that they've got 30 different owners and each one has a slightly different idea on how the data should be presented how the day-to-day operation should happen at their particular property. And I know because I was an owner with 
a management company that had other owners. And I was always trying to be the squeakiest wheel that got the grease. And so was all the other 20 or 30 people that were there. So like I said, 95% efficiency for me was the reason to do it. If I felt like we ever started to drop below 90% efficiency, I would probably shut the operation down and go third party because then it wouldn't make sense. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the operations and the properties that you have. Let's talk a little bit about how you decided, how you decide on sort of your debt and equity structure. Cause I think that's one of the big questions for people is how am I going to finance this? And then how am I going to raise the money? So right. maybe let's start on the debt side. So how have you been acquiring these properties? What type of debt have you been placing on these properties? I mean, these days we're pretty much doing Fannie Mae loans and we're fixing for 12 years as long as we can. And, uh, you know, we're looking to get 80% financing if we can and maybe throw in some uh, rehab dollars. But, you know, rehab dollars going through a, a loan also has its own set of challenges because then we've got to put in, you know, 150% of the amount. It's got to be impounded. We've got to, you know, do all kinds of paperwork to get the money out. So it is good. But if we can raise extra capital, sometimes it's actually better for us to just get an 80% loan and we just come in with the rehab money on our own and do the, do the work. Then we okay. don't have to worry about the paperwork as much. Okay. And then most of, how are you raising your equity for these transactions? Well, the way we raise capital is what I would call organically. From day one, you know, it was basically myself and another capital partner that we did the deals. And as we've become successful and the company's grown, I've always just talked to my uh, technology buddies about what I was up to at lunch breaks and stuff when I was at my old company. And inevitably people would say, Hey, you know, that sounds pretty interesting. Uh, maybe if I give you X number of dollars, you could put it into your next deal. And, you know, honestly, I've, I've never really gone out and looked for capital. It's just a collection of a lot of friends and family and referrals of, of technology partners now in the Silicon Valley. So I would say that all of our capital comes from the Silicon Valley and it's mostly all technology guys that are investing in these deals that we do. So what are they looking for in today's market in terms of return? And at what level do you think they're looking for in terms of structuring the deal? Like, what do they like to see and how have you been structuring these deals from an equity standpoint? Well, you know, investors are, I believe, right? And I'm, I'm one of them because I eat my own dog food. So investors are, I believe, pretty simple people in terms of what they expect. People expect you to deliver what you say you can do. So that's the biggest thing. If I had to put a number on it, you know, expectations have come down these days. You know, I think if investors can see a path to seven to 8% average returns over a, a 12 year hold from operations with an equity kicker at the back end, I think that most of my partners, my capital partners would be happy with that. I think three, four years ago, people were expecting a little bit more. But these days, I think people are more concerned about capital preservation as well as they're concerned about how much uh, returns they're going to get, right? Okay. In terms of uh, deal structure, I've always been a big believer that if I can't explain my deal structure to you in maybe two minutes or, or, or at the most three minutes, it's way too complicated. So our structure is very, very simple. It's a 25-75 split straight up. There's no pref returns or anything like that. And we don't charge syndication fees or acquisition or exit fees. There's no asset management fees. We just basically take 25% of the deal for doing all of our work. Well, that's pretty easy to understand. That didn't even take two minutes. It didn't. That's what I said. I, I always like to you know, exceed the bar, set the bar low. That's my motto. That's why I said that. <laughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit about you know, coming into, a, into the market like this. You live out in San Jose. You know, you live, play out in San Jose, but your money works in Texas. Any advice on how to build relationships in an area that is three hours on an airplane away? How do you do it? Well, the simple answer is that you really have to be focused on relationships and not on deals. Too many people that I see, especially outsiders, and believe me, when you're coming to a market from an outsider's perspective, especially California investing in Texas, there's going to be a stigma associated with you, a perception. And what, you, what's that stigma? Well, I think the stigma is that basically we come in with a bunch of capital and we don't necessarily know the markets or choose to care about the markets. And we're just looking out here just to make a couple bucks on the quick end. And I think that that could be true for many different people, not just California folks. So I think that what you have to do as a guy coming out here to Texas is you've, you've got to be willing to develop relationships. 
and it takes a long time. It, it doesn't happen overnight, but you have to do the fundamentals. You know, business is independent of the industries that you're in. You got to do what you say. You got to say what you do. You've got to be a man of your word or a woman of your word. And you've got to make it actually fun to do business. You know, you can't come in with any attitude about how you work with people. And if you really are truly committed to developing long-term partnerships that, by the way, are win-win, that's another thing that people don't understand. At least a lot of people that I see that aren't successful is that, you know, as a seller, you can't, it can't be all about getting over on the buyer. Every single thing can't always go the way of the seller. And now in these days, that probably is not so true, but... <laughs> You know, markets do change, but also as a buyer, you also can't be all about getting over on the seller. There's got to be a balance because at the end of the day, after the deal is transacted and everything closes, everybody walks away with an understanding or a perception of who you are and what you're about. And you can do one deal in a market any which way you, you choose to be, but to do that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth deal and so on and so forth, if that perception is bad in any way, it will severely limit the way that you can be successful in that market and you will burn bridges and you will not be successful. That I think is the key. Yeah. JC and I have done a lot, you know, several, many transactions together and he preaches the true word. It does have to be a win-win scenario. It cannot be just a win on the seller's part. It cannot be a win on the buyer's part only. It has to be a win-win on, on both sides. One of the things that he stands behind is that he closes on time. And so uh, talk a little bit about closing on time. Talk about you know, not going into the nitty-gritty of, of retrading for just to retrade. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, you have a very good reputation in the marketplace. You continue to preach what you do, and everyone wants to do business with you. So talk a little bit about you know, not bending with the marketplace. Well, I think that you know, closing on time is a really big deal. I think most people don't actually understand how important that is to everybody that's involved. And we're not just talking about the seller and the buyer. We're talking about the lender. We're talking about the realtors. We're talking about all these people that have to do a lot of work to make a transaction happen. But I'll tell you a story. I have one deal in particular that we closed on time. And I had a realtor come to me and say, you know, I've done... I don't remember how many transactions it had to be, you know, I'm sure it was 70 plus transactions. He said, and he's been in the business quite a while. He said, there's two people that have ever closed on time from the day that they went into contract out of all those transactions. He goes, it's this other person and you, he's like, that's it. He's like, if you ever want a reference, that's the only thing that I have to say to anybody, two people out of 70 plus transactions. The way that you do that is not easy. Obviously, it has a lot to do with the way that you're prepared. Obviously, you've got to have all your ducks in a row. For example, the lending side is usually the long pole in the tent. And some of it is, you know, there's unavoidable speed bumps, but you've got to have all your data ready to submit the package immediately. You've got to be on the ball. But the most important thing I think my advice would be is that you have to partner with the right lender to close on time, right? Obviously, there's a bunch of other stuff, title and everything else, right? But I think in my experience, the long pole has always been the lender. And so once I found a lending partner and, you know, Paul is, is obviously my, my go-to guy, but once I found a lending partner that enables me to, to close on time and do everything as diligently as I do and as quickly and efficiently, I just go with that particular partner every single time. And uh, it's a win-win-win actually now, right? Because now it's a win for the buyer, the seller, and it's a win for the lender and then the lender actually is more apt and more willing to, you know, to do a lot of extra legwork for me when I'm looking at new deals because I'm not floating these deals out that I'm looking at to five different lenders. And then, you know, none of them know if, I'm, if they're really ever going to get a deal, right? So there's lots of benefits that I get, but the biggest thing I get is I'm closing on time. And that's a huge deal because that stays with you in terms of your track record. You know, Fannie Mae absolutely loves JC. They want to do more transactions with JC. His transactions go to the top of the underwriting list because they know everything that they get from JC is going to be updated, accurate. All the forms are going to be completed correctly. So, you know, he's really won over Fannie Mae. And with that, that uh, gives him some flexibility in the market and also gives him the ability to push people when they need to be pushed in you know, he has some uh, good mojo. With, with <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I <laughs> like the, that. With the Fannie Mae lenders. And I would absolutely agree with 
your comments just around the relationships and win-win scenarios. In today's market where it's very competitive, closings are 45 days, sometimes maybe 60 days. And to win a deal, I mean, we had to submit an LOI not only with terms, debt structure, equity structure, proof of funds, but seller references for previous transactions. So they wanted to see, all right, on your last two or three, how did the other guy feel at the end of the transaction and how was the process? So absolutely, the win-win is a huge deal in the market. Yep. So James, I'm going to ask you that question. I mean, you deal with a lot of people that are, say, new buyers of apartment buildings. If they don't have the experience like JC has, how do you win a deal? How do you get it? So a lot of times we are putting sponsorship groups together and finding, connecting the dots maybe with somebody with the balance sheet, with the experience, and then the deal. So you got to really have those three components when you go in. And we work with a lot of operating partners and we're able to help them put together a team so that not only the transaction will be approved by the lender, but the listing broker has faith that we can get the deal done and they have the equity and the debt lined up, which is very key in this market. Let's drill down a little bit more on JC and managing a property from a distance. Now you have a your own management company with boots in the ground here. You have maintenance people, you have on-site managers, you have kind of a regional manager that kind of manages the property and that you're the asset manager. You oversee the property. You have direct connections with the lender. You have conversations with the investors, the equity investors into the deal. Is that tough being at a distance or because you have hired the right person makes it a lot easier? And how much more difficult would it be if you didn't hire that right person? Well, I think that absolutely it's critical to have the right team. When I first started, of course, it was more or less just me. So it was a lot, a lot more difficult in terms of the bandwidth that I had. But I really focused on hiring what I believe to be high caliber people, people of high integrity and people of you know high intelligence and, and high energy. We've been pretty blessed out here to find a really good team um, of people that we've brought on to the management piece. And, you know, without them, I would 100% tell you that we would be very unsuccessful. And we put a high value on that staff. So we pay them very well. And uh, we don't just pay them well, but we we treat them well. And we, we appreciate them. And, you know, people are like anything else, right? You If you appreciate people and you give them good pay and you hire the right people, they're, they're going to do good stuff for you. So your role has really changed from you being wearing all the hats to pushing it over to Edith, who really runs your portfolio here. She's the boots on the ground here, and you're the guy who's putting the transactions together. You have the relationships with the lenders. You have the relationships with the brokers and the debt sources and the equity. So you're really the asset manager. You oversee the entire crew that's building the business. Yeah, that, that's right. And uh, although I do, I'm probably more active in the actual operations than maybe some folks that are using third-party management companies, I definitely have out of necessity had to extract myself from you know a lot of the, the day-to-day stuff. But you'd be surprised. I still read a lot of reports and I still, uh, you know, sometimes once in a while we'll check in on late fees. It's not uncommon for people to know that I might do that that work for me. But just like anything else, you've got to be on top of your numbers uh, because if you're not, then... Uh, Sometimes those numbers don't work out so well. How many times are you flying from uh, the West Coast to Dallas? Well, if it's just on an operational basis, it's once a quarter. Okay. Um, and then I come out as needed for new deals or if we're going to be selling a deal or if there's some sort of unexpected reason for me to be in town. But generally speaking, if we're not in the middle of looking for a deal or exiting a deal, it'll be about once a quarter for operational reasons. So you've been in the market probably longer than most. I mean, buying your first deal in 2007... So you've seen us going through 2008, 2009, 2010. So you've seen it come back. Where do you think we are? I saw it go down even more. (laughs) I think the coming back part, you know, that was the fun part. That was the easy part, The going down part was the scary part. Okay, so maybe talk about that, right? So you bought a deal in 07. And that's, I mean, we went through a pretty rough downturn in 08 and 09. And people, they might see that coming in the coming future, but... 
it might be a couple more years before that comes. So how do you sort of mitigate that risk and prepare for that? I mean, okay, so the first thing I would say is that I feel lucky to have been a part of it. To be in the business and see things go down is a great way to have a true perspective on what things can go wrong. Because I guarantee you that not many people saw anything like that coming when it happened. A lot of people got caught with their pants down. You know, we did really well. Actually, we had actually bought those two deals I had mentioned in 2007. We actually bought a third deal that we closed right as the economy was crashing. The actual lender tried to pull out of the deal and we were going to lose our security deposit. We had a lot of money on the line. By some stroke of luck, we got the deal done and literally it, everything went to hell in a handbasket. Like the I'm next telling day. you, like the next week after, okay. we, I'm not, I'm not kidding yeah. around. Like right. it really was that close. Those three deals we've, we kept and we sold all three deals last year in October, like I said, oh. and we had some of our best performing years during the downturn. Why do you think that is? That's exactly what I tried to figure out. <laughs> I thought it was dumb luck and maybe some of it was, but I would like to believe that aside from the fact that I've always been very analytical and I bought on real numbers sure, and I, I always actually even got bank statements to prove that the income was coming in, something we still do. Right. The other thing that I did is I didn't just buy on numbers. You know, being out of state, a lot of people mistakenly think, well, if I underwrite a deal and I learn how to do all the math and everything works out, then this deal is a winner. And again, I'm turning the contrast up here. So it's not that, it's not that simple, sure. but you got to get out and walk the deals. You got to go and talk to the, and you have to also have to talk to experts in the market. For example, you and Paul, you guys are in a lot of ways. Some of the first people I call are my lender partners to ask them about a deal. Cause if they don't know that deal, they probably know the deal down the street that just traded, you know, several months ago. So you have to understand the sub market, the micro market, the competitive landscape of the deal. And also you have to Imagine that you're a renter because renters are like all of us. We want a home to raise our family. These aren't apartment units to the people that rent our units. Right. These are homes. So do you feel safe in that home when it's 12 o'clock at night on a Friday night? Do you feel safe there or do you not? These are the things that you have to understand as an owner to try to buy assets that really feel more like a secure and a safe home as much as it can be for what you're buying. If you do those sorts of things and when the downturn does happen, you know, uh, my personal belief of what happened was, you know, the population growth in Dallas has always been good. Even during the downturn, it was solid. The problem was that the fundamental single family unit compacted, meaning that if you had a mom that was, you know, in her mid forties and she had a daughter that was, you know, maybe working at Walmart and she was in her mid twenties and the, the son was working at Craig and auto store or whatever you would call it out here, the the auto parts store, and he was maybe 22. Well, when the recession hit, the daughter and the son lost their jobs, Walmart and Cragen. Well, of course, mom, she had been around long enough. She had stripes at her company, so she was able to hold on to her job. So what happens is the son and the daughter move back in with mom. Well, what does that mean to the apartment industry? Well, what that means is you went from having three units that were occupied to having one unit that's occupied. Now, again, I'm simplifying, but think now times that by a a million and you have what happened. And so if you're in the apartment industry and you own units, this is a simple fact of supply and demand. When there's a lot of supply and not a lot of demand, the the consumer gets to pick and choose where they're going to go and spend their dollars. If you've got a property that's in a better location, slightly better kept, you've got a great maintenance team that takes care of the work orders when they come in, guess what? You're going to have the three people that are living at your place and the other two vacant units, those are probably going to be the guys that aren't taking care of their properties as well. So you have to be the guy, if you want to survive in a downturn, that's running your property tip-top shape. That is what happened in the recession, in my opinion. And that's why I saw a lot of people that were in the apartment business get flushed down the toilet bowl. And me personally, I can tell you we did good. In fact, I wanted to buy more deals, but we just couldn't get debt financing back then. So let's also talk a little bit about what goes right and what goes wrong. And let's talk a little bit about, for you personally, you guys bought a transaction in North Garland. Talk to me a little bit about that property, what you did to it, and how you improved rents. And just in a, in a big picture, how much increase did you get on NOI by some of the things that you guys implemented? Well, you know, the profile of what we like to do is we like to look for deals that we can do an exterior rehab on, you know, cosmetic stuff. We typically like to try to stay away from foundation stuff like most people. 
but we can replace roofs, we can paint properties, we can improve the community amenities. That's all the stuff that we can do. Signage and marketing, we can improve. Uh, we like to start there. We like to look for deals where they need a little bit of spit shining, if you will. And then from there, I'm not as big of a fan of spending an exorbitantly large amount of money on interior upgrades, although I do believe that they do generate benefits. But I think that looking for the exterior rehab on an initial side is going to generate more bang for your buck. And then as you go along, you can start to upgrade the units naturally and sort of use your cash flows to do that. But you know, between exterior rehab and interior unit upgrades, these days, if we can look to push rents, you know, I would say, you know, an average of, you know, seven to ten percent. I think that we feel like that, you know, we we've done a good job. So go in, do the exterior rehab. At least now people are coming in the door and then do the interiors as as needed as they turn. That's right. Okay. Okay. That's right. So let's talk about what's gone wrong. What have you learned after all these years about what you should not have done? Yeah, I think that um, if there's anything that I would say that things that, that could go wrong, I think there's things that you can control and things that you can't control. Okay. An example would be, you know, a rough, rough, rough neighborhood. You can come in with the best intentions. You can, you can put a lot of money into the deal. You can upgrade the units. You can upgrade the amenities. You can, you can paint the deal. But if the community as a whole is what you're, you're trying to go up against, that's outside of your control. And you will get hurt. You may not get hurt now because it's been a great market, but I can see people and I've seen people get hurt in the downturn. So if I look back at all the deals we've done, and, and maybe it's, again, a little bit of dumb luck. I won't discount that, but also we've, we've tried to be intelligent about things. Any of the mistakes that we've made, and thank goodness none of them that we've ever made have been game over types of deals, but they've always been things that were not under our control. The mistakes that we've made were things that we just couldn't fix. We couldn't change, right? If it's a bad roof and we knew about it, well, you can replace a bad roof. There's some things that you just can't control, you can't fix. So in my mind, my advice would be make sure you understand what's controllable what's not controllable about a deal and make sure that you try to steer clear of deals where there's an uncontrollable thing that could have a negative impact on your success. How about amenities? What are you seeing in your portfolio that you're, you've been adding reserve parking? Is there things that, that you've been at maybe a dog park? What things have you added to bring value added to your properties? Well, you know, I always say that amenities they're like buying a house on the beach, right? You buy a house on the beach, you pay like millions of dollars more than you should so you live next to the beach, but then you just never go to the beach because you're always so busy, right? I've heard it so many times, and I actually used to live in a beach town community, and I can tell you I probably went maybe less than five times to the beach. Amenities are like that. It's more like I consider amenities to be the showroom floor of a car dealership. It's the way that we close deals, Right. When somebody walks into a beautifully remodeled community center, which got which has a you know a pool table and a, a sparkling pool, and, you know nice pool furniture, and it's got a large LCD TV in there, you know with Netflix available for all the, and then you know obviously all all the uh, prospective renters see that and they say, oh, this is a great place to live, and we're able to close the deal. Now, how many of those amenities that we spend lots of money on to actually complete the deals? How many of residents use those, I would, I would say not that many, if I had to really be honest with you, but it sure closes the deals for sure. And it gives a perception that it is a different community than it once was. So whether the, the residents decide to use it or not, I've seen that sometimes that they, they may not optimally use it as much as we'd hoped, but it certainly serves to change the perceptions of the community. What software package do you guys use for reports? And, and do you like it? And yeah. So, you know, I mean, when we first started going to strike off and do our own thing, you know, we looked at one site, you know, we looked at Yardi, um, and really those were the two biggies. We actually converged on a third one, which back then was a very, very early on, especially for the apartment business. They were a little bit more established on the single family home side. But we use a software called Appfolio. And they've since, I think, gotten a little bit more traction, but they're still not as big in terms of the adoption rate within the multifamily space. But we've actually found some really good benefits with the software. And so we use Appfolio currently for our uh, software system. 
So one of the things, you know, most of your deals are sort of the BNC space here in, in Dallas. And one of the concerns is just rent growth year over year over year. And will it ever stop and yes. flatten out? It yes. will. Okay. So how do you, when you're underwriting deals on acquisitions, how are you modeling rent growth and how do you keep the momentum going? in your property well these days if we're modeling at like let's say we're buying a deal and we're going to hold it for 12 years we're going to model the first year is basically going to be a an indication of it's going to be a hybrid between what the current owner did on a t12 or t6 and what we think we can do once we start to push rents so it'll be somewhere between what we think we can get to and what the old owner has gotten to in year two you know year two is really dependent on how much upside there is to get it to market or if we're going to be also be upgrading the interiors, maybe it's a little bit above what we would consider to be today's market. So year two is going to be whatever it's going to be based on the deal. Now, when you talk about years three through 12, that's where you're sort of at the mercy of the market. We're going to underwrite 2% these days. That's probably a little bit more conservative than I think you know maybe the average bear might be. Sure. But we've always been a little bit more on the conservative side anyways. You know, most people that, that know a little bit about the market will tell you that, you know, somewhere in the three to 4% range for the next couple of years might be a reasonable assumption. But beyond that, it's, it's really anybody's guess. It's, it's hard to say. Any challenges you think on the, so that's, that's on the revenue side when you're underwriting these deals. I mean, when you're looking at the expense side and trying to forecast that out, how are you looking at real estate taxes? That seems to be a biggie for owners coming in to the market and, you know, the assessed value might be 40, 50% of what they're buying it for. Yeah. It's a, it's a big deal. Certain counties are getting a little bit more aggressive these days. I mean, we, we bought a deal recently where the county assessed it at an exorbitantly larger amount of money over what we even paid for the deal. Right. I'm talking about like 30, 40% over what we actually even paid. Sounds like you got so, a good deal. You know, for, for, <laughs> forget about the, the old rule of thumb where you can say 80% of the purchase, purchase price. Yeah. These guys are going out there and saying, oh no, you know, let's just say that you bought it for 40% more and then we make you come in and prove what you bought it for. Well, hmm. I think after all said and done, even, you know, again, hiring a, a tax person to help us, those types of deals, we can still get them down to rates that are on par with our assumptions of 80% of the purchase price. But <laughs> You know, it's getting a lot harder these days on the real estate tax side, for sure. That's a, that's a huge expense, most definitely, that we're dealing with. So let's just kind of wrap this up. You're talking to somebody today, and you're, let's say you're having a conversation with somebody that is just getting into the multifamily business. Anything, any stories of what, should they get into the business? Is it a good business to get into? Any other things that you think on the top of your head to avoid? What would be the wise old sage, J.C. Castillo? What would you tell a young buck? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, having been through a downturn and having seen the upside in this market that we're in is um, if you truly want to win in the apartment business, you've got to be very, very long term minded and build relationships, long term relationships, you know, that make everybody successful around you, because I'm telling you that the downturn will happen again. It may happen sooner than, than we all hope it will. But when it does happen, it's not going to be as easy as it is these days. And you, everything's going to go back to how good your relationships are because there'll still be good deals to be had, even in, the, in, the, in a down market. And there'll still be people doing deals. But it'll just be a lot harder for the people that burned a lot of bridges to keep doing deals. So if you're coming in with a fresh slate and you've never done this stuff before, then be committed to being a true professional at your craft. It's like anything else. Take it seriously, right? You know, this is a craft, right? We, we all have been doing this for a long time now, and we take it seriously, right? And we're talking about people's uh, future investments, retirement funds that we do, at least in my site. So these are not uh, games that we're playing. And, you know, this is real money that people can stand to lose if we make mistakes, like I said, be committed to the long term and build relationships, you know, tight relationships that you can count on both in the good times and in the bad times because the bad times will happen again. Well, thank you, JC, for coming in and spending a little time on the podcast. If anyone wants to reach out to you with any questions, 
how what's the best way of reaching out to you whether it's email or phone number that you want to let our guests know about? Well, our company is called the Multifamily Property Group. So you can go to www.multifamgroup.com to check us out. And if anybody really needs to get a hold of me personally, then Paul has all my information. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. And, uh, you know, JC sounds and does just like he is. And he's a straightforward shooter, good asset manager, and has, uh, is truly passionate about what he does and i think you know we have known each other for a long period of time and he does a very good job with his properties uh don't forget in the podcast that if you do want to get more information concerning old capital's white paper report make sure you send us uh, an email requesting the white paper report again that's the multifamily 101 kind of goes into to greater detail how transactions are put together on the financing side it's about you know 15 16 page report Requested at info at oldcapitallending.com, info at oldcapitallending.com. And if you do enjoy the podcast, is one thing that we really never asked for is rate us. If you can go into either iTunes or Stitcher, is give us a rating on how we're doing. If you think we're doing a good job, just uh, let them know uh, in the rating system. We, we do appreciate that. Again, Five stars. James points out, make sure you put five stars. That would help us. and, and We can continue to do this. JC, we do appreciate you coming to the podcast. James, for, thanks for uh, hanging out with us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitallending.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you here next week with another great interview.